Welcome to Bible Mysteries. You're listening to episode 56, The Underworld, part 1. What if there are secrets in the Bible the world doesn't want you to know? Are you ready to take the red pill? And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Zena. Hello, welcome once again to Bible Mysteries Podcast. Hi, Zena. Hey. I'm here with the Warrior Princess again. That's me. <laughs> it is you. And you know, <laughs> I heard they actually named a TV show after you back in the 90s. They did. So actually, <sighs> I'm named after the TV show. Oh, if you guys rats. didn't know, I know. It would have been cool if it, it was named after me. I but... find that hard to believe, but okay. <laughs> but I'll if, give it to if them. It's coming from you. <laughs> it's got to be true. <laughs> Well, great, great. Well, listen, this will be our um, fourth episode of video, if you count our anniversary. That's true. And so we uh, did two episodes on Lucifer last Mm -hmm. week, learned a lot about him. Today, I think we're going to talk about the underworld. Ooh, the underworld. The underworld, yeah, which is basically there's a compartment in the earth that houses, as far as I can tell in Scripture, three separate individual compartments within it. That's right. It houses H-E double hockey sticks. Right. It houses the fiery pits Mm -hmm. and Abraham's bosom. This is one smart cookie here. Uh, I remembered. (laughs) That's really cool. That's right. And a lot of people think about hell and just what comes to my mind or their mind is the burning place. Yes. But there's actually three separate compartments of the place of the dead Mm -hmm. and we're going to learn both the Hebrew and the Greek word for it. The Greek word most people are familiar with, the word Hades. Yes. A lot of people heard that because he was the name of a god, Pluto in the Romans and Mm -hmm. Hades in the Greek. So some of us, at least to be, used to be, they would sort of teach a little bit of mythology you know, in in grammar school. Yeah. And so you kind of got some of those names like Apollo and Zeus, you know. Mm -hmm. So Hades was one of them. But uh, we're going to find out that what that word literally literally means, it's the place of the dead. Really? Because when I think of Hades, okay, I think of the movie, um, what is it? Was it Hercules? No. It was a Disney one. It's um, something with the lightning bolt. Ah, what is his name? Something with a lightning bolt. Ah... Zeus comes to my mind too, but I'm not I can't sure. think. I can't think of the name, but yeah. someone's gonna know exactly what I'm talking about down in the comment section. But like, yeah. um, there's this movie where this guy and like he finds out that he's part um, god, part human, and well, that's like Hercules. Is it Hercules? Yeah, yeah. If if you're thinking about what I'm thinking about, which may not. <laughs> But Hercules was supposed to be part man, part God. Right. And, and then did he have a friend that was like part goat, part human? Yes. Um, I can't think of his name right now. But I, <sighs> even, even when I was a kid, there was a cartoon called Hercules. Okay. And he had that Maybe little, that's what I'm thinking yeah. of. And, like, and then Disney what, did a movie take Yes, on. yes, yes, yes. And James Wood was Hades. The actor James, James Wood James, played. James, James Wood. Yeah, he's kind of a, he's an older actor, but he, he was. Did he have like a long beard? Yeah, he was sort of bluish gray in color with white hair as the cartoon. Yes. As the character. And he lived in hell. He was Hades. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's what I think of when I think of hell. I think of yeah. that movie yeah. and how Hades was. Well, that, that that's kind of based on the truth of the meaning of the word Hades in the Greek okay. realm of the dead. So we'll, um, we'll look at that. Uh, and as you've heard me say before, you know, a lot of these myths and legends from antiquity really are a distortion of the truth of what really happened, because if Hercules was part man and part God, that would make him a Nephilim. That's true. Angels and humans combining. And so most of the stories about Hercules or Zeus's children or Poseidon, whatever, Mm -hmm. are kind of based on the fallen angels or the dark angels that came down and took the daughters of men. So um, we go to the scripture to get the accuracy of it where the word of God's concerned and try to use that to reveal the mystery. Yeah. Now, was Hercules a giant? Well, according to the Greek legends, he wasn't. But if he was, in fact, uh, and, and he's also Heracles, Hercules are the same kind of name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he could correspond to other regions' mythology. 
like, you know, the Babylonians had a similar account. The Egyptians had a similar account. I don't know which name he would be in those languages. But they all say he's the product of a god, fallen angel, mm -hmm. and a human mother. And therefore, that would make him one of the Nephilim. Mighty men, men of renown. Okay. So they had great strength and in great size in many cases. So Hercules could have been a giant. Ooh. You know? Now, in the Greek studies, the giants were called titans. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Titan. Which is, the, which is the name of the Tennessee football, NFL. Like Titans, <laughs> Tennessee Titans, you know. So. I thought there was a different name for them. They, well, no, when they, they used to be the Houston Oilers until they moved to Nashville. Ew, the Houston Oilers. <laughs> come on, guys. Can we come up with a better name? Houston Oilers. <laughs> That's gross. <laughs> now we're going to get into the same discussion I have with my wife about Green Bay. She doesn't <laughs> understand why they're called the Packers. And it's like, I mean, okay, it's not Cougars or whatever, Ravens, but there's a, there's a history. <laughs> so I've got a friend who's a big Packers fan, so I'm not going to diss Green Bay. Yeah, yeah. But I will talk all day long about the Saints. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, we'll dive into Hades because, as, as the title suggests, the underworld, it's in the lower parts of the earth. Yes. And so Paul writes about that in Ephesians chapter 4. So we'll read starting in verse 7. And, and the context is Paul was talking about gifts that God gave to mankind through Jesus. Okay. And he says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, meaning when Christ rose from the dead, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He's quoting a, a, a book of the Old Testament. But then he puts these parentheses, like here's a thought behind what he just said. And it's this. Now that he ascended, Jesus rising, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? <clears throat> he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So we're all aware of the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he ascended up to the Father. Yes. But when we think about his death on the cross, when he died, he was three days in the tomb and then he resurrected. Yes. During those three days, he went to hell. What? Not everybody understands that. He descended into the lower parts of the earth. And we're going to look at that in scriptures. Did he go to Abraham's bosom? He went to all of it. Oh. He saw all three compartments, which is why, well, of course, he's God, so he revealed it through his spirit anyway, mm -hmm. but he experienced it for a reason. And so when we get into thinking of, uh, you've heard us use the expression, the Lamb of God. Yes. So Jesus is the Lamb of God. And when he was crucified, he died on the day of um, Passover. And the Passover was a Jewish feast mm -hmm. in which they killed a lamb without spot or blemish and they roasted it in fire and they ate it. That's right. Right? And nothing could be remained. Nothing could be left. You know, no leftovers. You had to destroy it or eat it. Mm -hmm. So it's a picture of Jesus in hell. Because okay. he descended first and he went to hell to suffer the wrath that we deserve so we wouldn't have to. And then we're going to find that he preached to some of the chained angels in the abyss. And then we're going to find that he must have presented himself to the um, Abraham's bosom side mm -hmm. because he even said to the thief on the cross when he was crucified with him, today you'll be with me in paradise. And when he, when he descended that day, he went down into Hades. Okay? So we're going to look at all of those areas, but first just to drive home to our listeners the fact that this area, Hades, uh, is in the lower parts of the earth. Mm -hmm. That phrase is used more than once. If we go to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, and it's chapter 44, we read in verse 23, Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. So there's a context about Israel's redemption. But the point is, sing heavens, the Lord hath done it. Shout ye lower parts of the earth. Now the people that would be occupying the prison of hell wouldn't have anything to shout about. Yeah. You know, they're already separated from God. So who would be shouting for God's work in the lower parts of the earth? 
Everyone in Abraham's bosom. You're right. That's exactly right. So that would mean that they're the righteous yes. who had been looking for who knows how long for the Redeemer to finally come. And even Christ said at some point, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And Abraham lived hundreds, if not a thousand or more years before Jesus. Or no, more than that, 2,000 years before Jesus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when he said that, he was speaking to a bunch of doubters, Pharisees. And he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he did see it. And they, caught, they accused him of blasphemy. Okay. Because they're saying, by saying that, you make yourself the son of God. And he's like, <laughs> duh. What part of miracles do you not understand? Right? <laughs> so we go to the Psalms. And the 63rd Psalm shares this information about the lower parts. He says, because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. It's like clings to it. Thy right hand upholdeth me, but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the lower parts of the earth also seems to imply that there's people there that would shout at what God has done in a happy way. And there's people there who seek to destroy David in the context and they're going to go in the lower parts of the earth, and it talks about them being killed. So that would be hell. That would be the portion that would not be paradise. Okay. So that lower parts of the earth, in the Hebrew word, which is the equivalent of Hades, is Sheol. Okay. Sheol in Hebrew, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. But it's translated in the King James Bible as hell, the grave, and the pit. And there's modern translators or modern theologians that try to imply that hell is not an actual compartment in the earth. It's just the grave. But the grave is shallow compared to yeah. hell. So I don't buy that. I think that they're trying to dismiss the idea that there's a literal hell because they don't want to confront that. You know? Yeah. They find it offensive. You know? Well, I've been told, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said, like having the background in being a Jehovah Witness, mm -hmm. We were told there's no hell, that we're actually living in hell. Oh, if only that were true. Um, and I've yeah. been like, man, I really can't wait to get out of this hell. Yeah, and we'll see that hell literally um, is a prison that's temporary, mm -hmm. but will ultimately be emptied into the lake of fire. And so the, the uh, ultimate place of judgment and we'll do an episode on the lake of fire itself because it is a separate entity it is not in the underworld right now it okay. is, doesn't even exist right now but all that are unrighteous and all the angels and satan and the antichrist are all eventually going to be cast into the lake of fire where they'll spend eternity so um yeah it, people that would say for any reason whether they're religious or jehovah's witnesses or even atheists there's no hell hells on earth have no idea what's coming yeah. Because as hellish as earth can be for some mm -hmm. over the years, there's been a lot of bad things, you know, and we, we haven't seen the half of it. You know, we have, the world doesn't really understand how wicked this planet was before the flood of Noah. You know, when you think of all the bad that's ever been done in the world. Yeah. Nazis, communism, murders, wars, mm -hmm. everything. It pales in comparison to what the Nephilim were doing when they controlled humanity wow, and enslaved them and devoured them and yes, so they sacrificed were, them. Oh, wow. So they were eating them. Yeah. So when, again, you get back to those Greek mythology. Legends. Yeah. Some of that is based on that and they whitewashed it because the entire system of the world is trying to erase the very idea that there was ever a humanity that was superior to the way we are now, mm -hmm. like Adam and Eve would have been perfect specimens. Yes. And um, the, the evolutionary thinking is we're evolving, we're getting better, smarter, all that. And the evidence is the opposite. Mm -hmm. We have devolved from that perfect genetic makeup. Our DNA coding is getting worse. We're getting more diseases, more conditions. Uh, what's keeping us alive and long lived right now, as long as we do live, 70, 80, 90 years, is technology. Oh. Science, you know, vaccines, medications, uh, surgeries, whatever. But I mean, cancer is a perfect example of degeneration of cells. Yeah. You know, and mutation.
Mm -hmm. And so genetic mutations are almost always detrimental to the organism. It's not like you get a, become a mutant and now have superpowers. It'd be awesome. We had superpowers. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know how strong the first race of humans were, Adam and Eve and their kids. Could they, were they superior intellect? Were they able to see farther like an eagle? Could they read minds? Uh, could they move things with their minds? Telekinetis. Yeah. yeah. We don't know. They might have had those kind of abilities and we'll get those back when we have glorified bodies mm -hmm. and eat from the tree of life. So it's fascinating to think about. The world has turned the entire tables on the whole story. We're getting better, smarter, faster, stronger. We're not. That's the lie. And what's coming to, I just read an interview about Elon Musk talking to Joe Rogan on his podcast. Oh. <laughs> and he's talking about how great AI is and we're going to basically going to be able to enhance our capabilities through bionics and stuff in our brain and chips are going to be put in there and he's saying it's coming and ugh. I'll be quite honest, I'm fine with the way that I am. Yeah. I'm cool with it. I don't want any implants in my head. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, it's fine. I want to make mistakes. I want to be human. I don't want to be beep, 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 beep. Yeah. I'm good. Well, that entire, I guess you could call it study or desire or line of thinking that he is espousing is called transhumanism and it's coming. I can see a lot of billionaires getting that. That's, that's who's doing it. Ultimately, I see, I'm just going to say this, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, Yeah. but I do believe the Bible when it says, in the latter days perilous times shall come. What I see occurring right now is the satanic global elite, or hydra, thinning the population of humanity to reduce us to uh, basically a more controllable number of slaves so the elites can become these transhuman controllers and yeah. owners of us. So they're trying to um, cull the weak, the uh, in their minds now, I'm not saying we're weak. I'm saying to the elites, yeah. we are expendable. Cull the weak, cull the simple, mm -hmm. cull the diseased, whatever, you know, uh, and make room for their new world order. Boring. Yeah, exactly. In other words, Nazis. Aryans. Yeah, you know, that's crazy. The master race. That's what they're pushing. So anyway, back to Sheol. I, that, <laughs> enough of my rant on uh, conspiracies. But we just, love them, though. I do, too. I, I could get off topic and talk all day. And I bet you some of our listeners would enjoy that. From time to time. <laughs> but in verse 34 of Genesis 37, it says, And Jacob rent or tore his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his sons many days. Uh, his son. And Jacob, you might recall, is the name of Israel before God changed his name to Israel. Mm -hmm. And he had 12 sons. But when his, uh, bo uh, before his last son was born, his youngest son was Joseph. And, uh, you know, so there was a final, a, a later son named Benjamin that was born. But um, when Joseph was the youngest, his older brothers were jealous of him. Have you ever heard of this, uh, the, the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? I have not. Okay. It was a famous Broadway musical, and it's a play on this. Okay. It's a, it's a, Joseph was favored by his son Jacob, and Jacob made him a coat of many colors. So somehow that got turned into an Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat by Hollywood or New York <laughs> or Broadway. But anyway, he, um, his, son, his brothers hated him. And so they sold him into slavery. That's right. In Egypt. Because wasn't he supposed to be like a king or a prince? Yeah. Well, he ended up being second in command under Pharaoh okay. uh, eventually and saved Israel through that. So God turned it around to him for good. But his brothers sold him out and they wanted to kill him. But a couple of the brothers said, please don't do that. Let's just at least get rid of him and keep him alive. But they told their father, Jacob, that he had been eaten by wild animals. So that's what he's talking about. He rose up to, they rose up to comfort him at the thought that his son was dead because Jacob right now thinks Joseph is dead. Yeah. But he refused to be comforted and said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. M-O-U-R, mourn, like sad. Mm -hmm. Thus his father wept for him. So down unto the grave is Sheol. So where the modern theologians want to say, yeah, he's talking about mourning in the, in the six feet in the tomb. Yeah. You don't mourn. Your body's dead. 
Mm -hmm. You don't have any, your conscious, your dead is it's nothing. It's just bones. He's talking about being in Sheol, Hades, where he would, uh, whether he knew it or not, be in Abraham's bosom as the righteous friend of God here. But he's talking about, it's going to make me so sad, I'm going to go down into Abraham's bosom mourning. Okay. So the place of the dead. So Sheol is literally means the underworld, the grave, hell, the pit. And it's the Old Testament designation for the abode of the dead. So whether you were the righteous dead or the unrighteous dead, Sheol encompassed the whole thing. Hence, okay. The Greek version is Hades. Now, why do they call it the pit? I think it has to do with that abyss, the bottomless pit. Okay. Because it's all down there. Mm -hmm. So grave, hell, and pit, in a sense, kind of typify the three different compartments of the underworld. That's true. Right? So go to Proverbs chapter 15 with us. And I say that for those of you that might be able to follow along with your Bibles, which yes. I always encourage you to do. <laughs> <laughs> and in chapter 15, verse 24, we read, The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. And hell in this passage was from translated from the word Sheol. Okay, so you can see that let's say a person died righteous like Abraham. Mm -hmm. So he goes to paradise or Abraham's bosom, like you said. Well, he's still in Hades. He's not resurrected yet into the new world or the eternal life or the new heaven, right? So. Mm -hmm. So by following the Lord, he may have gone down into the underworld, mm -hmm. but he will come up in resurrection, right? Okay. Whereas the unrighteous, when they die, end up in hell, they won't escape that prison until the time of the judgment where it will be determined if they go into the lake of fire. And so, yeah. So as righteous people die, are yeah. they going into Abraham's bosom? Not today. They did all of this took place for centuries prior to Jesus dying. Okay. So until Christ could die and go down into Sheol or Hades and pay the price for sins through the sacrifice of his shed blood, nobody that was even righteous like Abraham or whoever could come out of Hades. Once he paid the price and the word in the Bible is propitiation. It was like the sacrifice was pleasing. It fulfilled the debt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once he was the propitiation, then he paved the way for men to ascend up to be with God in heaven. Okay. Prior to that, even though men were righteous, their sins had not yet been paid for. Therefore, they could not ascend up to the Father except under certain circumstances. And the one that we know of in the Bible that did was a man named Enoch who went to, God took him. <clears throat> and there's another man named Elijah who went to heaven in a chariot of fire. Oh. Yeah. So, like I said, we've talked in the past about 24 elders in heaven. Mm -hmm. Some, it could be those two might be two of those elders. Okay. You know, we don't know that, but that's a speculation, you know. So anyway, that's a great question that you asked because, yeah, why are, do men now still go down into Abraham's mm -hmm. bosom? I don't believe they do. Uh, I believe, though, that they might again. And I say that because when the rapture takes place and the current church of the body of Christ goes up to be with the Lord in heaven, then the preaching of the message on the earth is going to change because it'll be the time of tribulation. It'll be the time of God's wrath. It will be the time of Israel's trial until they are restored and Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. And there will be martyrs that are killed by the Antichrist for their testimony of Jesus. And I think they may go down into paradise and join their nation, Abraham and Jacob and the rest, because they're all going to come up in resurrection when the Lord returns. Okay. So there's a possibility that they go there. Now, Psalm 16, verse 10 says... For thou, and this is a, uh, David wrote this psalm, and he's a king, but he's also a prophet. Okay. So he's prophesying of Jesus Christ. So these are the words of Jesus before he was ever born. He says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. 
Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So while David too would have died and gone into Abraham's bosom, and he could apply this to himself, the truth is also that Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth, like we read, and God did not leave his soul in hell. He raised him up from the dead. And so it was a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. And ultimately the resurrection of all the righteous. In Psalm 30, we read in verse 3, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. So the implication is if you were unrighteous and you went to hell, you're, it's only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. You know, for like from... If hell was a place of torment where you could have a conversation like the rich man did with Abraham in his bosom, mm -hmm. right, across the chasm, which we'll get to in this, in this uh, either part one or part two of this episode, um, imagine in the pit you wouldn't be able to do that. Okay. You would descend into darkness and blackness, and then there would be nothing to converse with, nothing to, you know, yeah. I don't want to go there. Nobody does. So like we said, Sheol is the Hebrew word, Hades, mm -hmm. and it would have been pronounced something like Hades in Greek. But it's uh, Pluto, or it's the god of the lower regions is what it means. It's Orcus, the netherworld, the realm of the dead. And it was later used as the word, the grave, death, and hell. So it's the equivalent of Sheol. And so in the New Testament, we see three different words used for hell in Greek. Hades is one of them. So we'll look at that one first in the book of Luke. So we'll go to Luke chapter 19, and we'll read in verse 19. Oh, 16. I'm sorry, not Luke 19. I don't know what I'm <laughs> By the way, if you ever see I'm reading wrong, just correct it. <laughs> I, and this is the story of the rich man we talked about earlier. Okay. So Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That means he, high on the hog, he lived. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, implying that he doesn't even get a crumb yeah. from the rich guy. He just Aww, doesn't care. For Lazarus. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And that couldn't even afford to go to the doctor. The dog's saliva was his medicine. Oh, you know? poor guy. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. They took him down to paradise. And what they carried was his soul. Okay. Because his body would have been put in a tomb, right? The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. And right off the bat, I noticed one thing missing. No angels carried him anywhere. No. You think about angels carrying Lazarus and you get a picture almost of God's loving care for the righteous, mm -hmm. you know, who probably encouraged him and said, we're taking you to a better place, you know. Whereas the beggar, or excuse me, the rich man dies and the next thing you know, he's, you know, he's screaming. Yeah. He's in torments, you know. He's in flames and he seeth Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom, meaning in paradise, that region. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So hell is real and it's hot. Yeah. And there's a fire there that can burn a soul. Because the rich man's physical body isn't there either. Mm -hmm. That's also in a tomb. Probably a much nicer tomb than Lazarus. Yeah. But little comfort that would be to him, yeah. right? <clears throat> So I'm tormented in this flame, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, because he was rich, uh, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Now you know the Gulf of Mexico, right? Mm -hmm. The Gulf, right? Well, this is a great body of something, and it's called a gulf. I doubt it's water. But I just think, all I can think of is like lava and bones. Yeah, maybe. Maybe like a, 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 you know, lava. And the gulf could also be a chasm, like it's empty, which implies that it might be the bottomless pit. 
Okay. In between them. So in words, if it was water, they could probably fill, build a boat and sail, mm -hmm. right? But he says, between us and you is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So whatever this gulf is, it's impassable. Okay. Can't sail over it, can't pole vault, can't build a bridge. <laughs> then he said, Laz uh, the rich man, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, Abraham, he must be a Jew, right? That thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So at this point, the rich man becomes evangelist. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's got, I got five brothers. I don't want them to come here. Yeah. I want them to get saved. So he's asking him to send Lazarus back from the dead mm -hmm. to preach to the brothers. And Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, just like you did, rich man, you could have listened to the prophets and the teaching of the law, and you could have done the right thing mm -hmm. and been here with me. But you chose not to, and you wouldn't listen to the prophets and, the, and Moses. So your brothers get the same opportunity that you did. Yeah. Then he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. It's like if a ghost appeared to them, they would change their way. Yeah. And he said unto him, if neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And think He's got about, a point. Think about that statement. One did rise from the dead, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he did proclaim the truth of resurrection. And today people still won't believe on him. Yeah. So what Abraham said was prophetic for everybody not even just the rich man there. Now, the man <clears throat> is in hell, but he's in torments. Abraham and Lazarus are in Hades too, but they're not in torments, they're comforted. Mm -hmm. So Hades is the overall compartment. But the man that's rich here, that's in torments and flame, is in a place that the Bible uh, translates from the Greek word gana. Gana. And it's hell is the place of the future punishment called Gehenna or Gehenna of fire. This was originally the Valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned, a fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. So it's like, imagine like a garbage dump that's burning because of rotten carcasses and things, Ugh. and you had to burn it so it wouldn't disease and mm -hmm. whatever. But what a lot of people don't know is the Valley of Hinnom is also the place where they uh, sacrifice their children to the fire, to Moloch. Mm -hmm. And that, so that became the garbage dump because it was cursed in their mind. It was like, this is the place where we murdered all those babies. And uh, therefore, the Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, Valley of Hinnom, became uh, synonymous with hell. And I remember growing up in the in the 80s, uh, and I know this wasn't what the song was about, but Pat Benatar was a female vocalist. Okay. Great, great singer. I loved it. Rock and roll, you know, one of the chicks of rock, you know. <laughs> and she had a song called Hell is for Children. And while she wasn't talking about Gehenna, oh. <laughs> you know, she wasn't. But um, it was, uh, it might have been talking about like child abuse or something. But okay. Either way, it, it got the point across, you know. And uh, so hell's not for children, actually, but if there is a hell, for children, it is on earth. It's the when they're abused or murdered or whatever. Okay, that makes sense. But their spirits and their souls would go to the Lord because mm -hmm. a child is innocent. And so true. Yeah, they would babies. never be held accountable for rejecting God's truth because mm -hmm. they're babies. They're innocent. Yeah, they, they don't know any better. They don't know any better. Now, that word Gehenna, <clears throat> this gets kind of disturbing, but I'm going to read it because I want people to know it. It's in the book of Mark chapter 9, and it's translated as the word hell, in this passage. But interestingly enough, this passage gives us a glimpse into Guiana. Okay. And you might have heard some of this. You might be familiar with this, but Christ said in chapter 9, verse 43, if I hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, Guiana, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. 
it is better for thee to enter halt, which without a leg, into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Again, Gehenna. Okay. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now, three times he says this, as if to drive home the point. Yeah. Now he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and uh, the, the message of, of for Israel at the time. But if you apply it to the world today, you know, you wouldn't have to cut your hand off it offended to escape hell. You just believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But he's still giving us a picture of hell, the prison, when he says the fire is not quenched and their, T-H-E-I-R, possessive, their worm dieth not. What do you think that means, Zena? Well, didn't you say that when people go to hell, um, worms are eating on them? It does appear that way. Because yeah. the fire is not quenched, and they're, and I, all I imagine is like a worm eating yeah. on someone and it not dying because there's just so much to eat. Yeah. Well, when you think about that Greek word, Gana, mm -hmm. and the fact that it's a reference to the Valley of Hinnom, where the corpses were decomposing and whatnot, you know, while they would have burned it, uh, either prior to or even after the fire is out, worms are going to, you know, you've seen a dead animal yeah. on the side of the road, an armadillo or something, mm -hmm. and the maggots get in there. So that's the picture he's painting. Carcasses getting eaten up, and, and it's nature's way of cleaning up the mess. Yeah. You know, the maggots are maybe disgusting to us, but uh, all of the, you know, buzzards eating a coyote or something yeah. you know, that died. I mean, all that's part of the natural ecosystem to get rid of the waste. But it's still a horrifying thought that in hell, there are worms eating. Yeah. The, the soul body. Not okay. just the flesh and blood, okay. but the soulish body. So it's a hor horrifying thought, you know. Is everybody in hell assigned a worm of some kind? Ooh. That eats them? Forever? Yeah. yeah. Hello, I am uh, Bob, and I'm going to be eating on you today. <laughs> like, it, it, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's the closest thing they get to a friend. Yeah, maybe so. I don't know how friendly it would be, but uh, <laughs> it just tells you what a horrifying place it is, you know. So don't go there. No, don't. Make good decisions. Make good decisions. And then um, Christ said in Luke chapter 12, verse 4, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which, hath, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So the idea is it would be God that would cast an individual into hell for rejecting his truth. Yeah. And remember that ultimately <clears throat> he's calling mankind back to him. He made us in love to serve him. We rebelled and followed Lucifer. We have the... Um, redemption in his son Jesus who paid for our sins by going here into this place. He encountered the worms. He encountered the flames for us and then rose from the dead because he paid for the sacrifice. And so now this gift is offered freely to mankind. And when man hears it <clears throat> and rejects it, they're choosing to go to the place of torment, Gehenna, rather than have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So when Zena says, don't go there, she's not joking. Yeah, I do have a question about that. So okay. um, there's always a statement that like one sin is worse than another sin. Um, for instance, let's say someone murdered their whole family. So right. throw it out there. And while they're in jail, because typically people get life sentences or they get death row, whichever, um, uh -huh. they decide that they want to, um, you know, lean on God. They want to allow God into their life. Are they going to go to hell when they die? So anybody that accepts Christ as savior, he paid for their sins. Okay. So regardless of how bad the sins were, they are now covered by the blood of Christ. It okay. doesn't matter how bad they were. It would include the sins of... I might do tomorrow, even though I'm saved now. 
Okay. Because God, when, when Christ died 2,000 years ago, all of our sins were in the future. Mm -hmm. So for him to pay for the sins of the world, it would have had to include all the sins we would ever commit. Okay. And they were all placed or imputed unto Jesus so that when he went to hell, they were left and burned. The Bible says he'll separate our sins as far as the east is from the west, which is never ending. Okay. You know, if you take a line and it'll just go on forever. In Christ, you have God's righteousness exchanged for your sin. Okay. Our sin was put on Jesus. His righteousness was given to us. So therefore, the Bible even says that if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all. So even if all you ever did was tell a lie, you would be guilty of everything the law says not to do. Don't kill, don't steal, don't murder, whatever, you know. So the point is saying, I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as her or him won't do you any good. Okay. God's not looking at comparative. There, may, there will be an assignment of the punishments. So, for example, a Hitler would suffer worse consequences ultimately than a guy that just was a pretty decent person all their life but never trusted Christ. Yeah. Knew about it, decided, no, I'm an atheist, I'm going to make my own way. And never believed there even was a God or something. But was a good person. Yeah. You know, didn't run around and rob and kill. So they would still be in hell without God, but they wouldn't be in the bottom where the worst offenders are. Okay. You know, the angels that sinned and things like that. And speaking of the bottom, that brings us to the Greek word tartaru. And we'll uh, probably have to uh, pause here and wrap it up because we got a lot more to cover and we'll put that in part two. But tartaru or tartarus is a, the other word in Greek that's translated as hell. And it's the name of the subterranean region doleful and dark, regarded by the ancient Greeks as the abode of the wicked dead, where they suffer punishment for their evil deeds. It answers to Gehenna of the Jews. But I would suggest that that definition in a concordance, which anybody can look up just like me, is not sufficient because where it's translated is in 2 Peter chapter 2. And when we find out who's there, you're going to find out something different. 2 Peter 2 verse, oops, chapter two, verse four, <laughs> says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, Tartarus, yeah. and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Well, there's a special compartment there because an angel in hell is a different entity than a person. Yes. You know, we were flesh and blood, we die, we're a soulish body, if we're unrighteous in hell where the worms are and the flames are. An angel is of a different makeup and we don't even know that they died. I'm not sure that they died in the sense of like flesh and blood can die. So they just were chained up and thrown in a prison. So the impl implication is they could get out if it weren't for the chains. Oh. And the lid or the gate or the bars or whatever that might be covering the opening. So this place where they are delivered into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. They're there until the Lord chooses to judge them in the last time. So are they like in cells in the bottomless pit or they're in hell in cells? I, I think they're in the bottomless pit. Okay. In these cells, if you want, or chains or whatever it is, some sort of way to keep them there. And then we get another picture of the same thing in the book of Jude in verse 6 where it says... And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. And these angels, by the way, folks, are the ones that sinned in Genesis 6. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that took the daughters of men to wife and had the children giants. But they left their own habitation. It says, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. So obviously angels need to be chained up because if they could get out. And there is a point at which some things come out. Mm -hmm. in the future of the bottomless pit. And we can see that in Revelation chapter 9, and maybe that'll be a good stopping point for today's message. Revelation 9 verse 1 says, And the fifth angel sounded, and we're talking about these were trumpets of the book of Revelation, so each angel sounds a trumpet and another thing happens. And there's seven of them, so this is the fifth one. The fifth angel sounded on the trumpet, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
and he opened the bottomless pit. So it obviously has a lid or a door or something. And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. So it must be burning in there too. Okay. Right? Not just in Guyana, but in Tartarus. All right? So the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke out of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. What is a scorpion's power? It's a tail. That stinger, right? And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And it turns out, we won't take the time to read further, but they have an angel who is their king that comes up out of the bottomless pit with them. And his name is Apollyon, the destroyer. I actually like that name. Why does it have to be the destroyer? <laughs> it's a, it kind of sounds pretty, and then you read it, you know. I know. I'm like, ooh, that future kid name, Apollyon. That sounds fancy. Never mind. <laughs> well, we'll read the rest of it, because I think now that you've mentioned that, it would be a, a good thing to just wrap it up with these last few verses. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces as the faces of men, they had hair as the hair of women, so I guess it's like long hair. Ooh, nice hair. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So there's going to be things coming out of the bottomless pit. And who knows, what did these things come from? You know? Yeah, like when they're torturing people, are they like hitting their heads on their chest or are they just stinging them with their tails? Yeah, it's hard to know exactly what that is, you know, but they're horrifying creatures that are going to come up. And they're going to be, during the time of tribulation, they're going to be, here's the thing, they're going to attack men, but they can't die. So are they attacking righteous men or non-righteous men? Non-righteous because it says they can only hurt the ones that don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. So you know who that would be? That would be those that took the mark of the beast. All the people getting those stamps in their brains. Right. Actually, you're just opening up the whole thing. I was thinking <laughs> of. What if the mark changes them genetically yeah and so they can't die they're being prepared for this you know yeah they can't be redeemed but they can't die i'm telling you folks you don't want to mess with this mm -mm. ai transhuman mm -mm. genetic manipulation that's going on yeah. and uh so what we're going to do next week is we're going to pick up here where we left off and we're going to continue to talk about the underworld yes because we haven't even really gotten to describing paradise, Abraham's bosom, and what ultimately is going to happen when the Lord empties that out. Okay. Or I did have one thing it. to say. Yeah. So, Guyana is where humans go. So, that's our hell. And then... True. I'm going to butcher this. Tartar, tartar. Say, I just say tartar sauce. Tartar sauce. <laughs> Tartarus. Tartarus. There we go. Tartarus is where non-human bad things go. That's what it appears. Okay, just wanted to make sure I got that correct. And to even simplify it further, the burning place of hell is the is the prison for humans, unrighteous. Tartarus, or the bottomless pit, is the prison for fallen angels. Okay. Yeah, and where ultimately all of that we're going to find is going to be emptied out into the lake of fire. So we'll yes. get to the lake of fire, and like I said, we'll do a whole episode on that. Wait, so the bottomless pit is not the lake of fire? Not now. Okay. Not yet. Okay, not yet. Neither okay. is hell. Yeah, neither is hell. They're, they're <laughs> ultimately going to be emptied into. The okay. contents of them will be emptied into the lake of fire, which doesn't exist yet. And the really shocking thing when we discuss the lake of fire is it's going to be on the earth. What? Yeah. This whole time I was thinking kind of like the lake of fire is probably that gold thing. 
Yeah, I, I think in a way the connection is there though, because okay. it's going to ultimately be converted into it if you want, you know. But it's almost as if uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in more detail because it looks like it's going to be an Edom. Oh, yeah. Okay. And we're going to do a whole thing about Edom and Esau because there's something. I've been studying about that I can't reveal just yet because I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. But there's some wild stuff concerning Esau. Ooh. Yeah. And like, are the so the bottom, the lake of fire is going to be in Edom, Texas? No, not Texas. We're too cool for that. Yeah, Texas, you know, I don't want... God, <laughs> God is the one who wrote, don't mess with Texas. Right? Yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> so we don't want... Not in our backyard. We don't want the garbage in our backyard. <laughs> well, Zena, thank you. For being here. Of course. And thank you all for joining us today. I hope you'll join us next week for part two of The Underworld. Yes. As always, thank you guys so much for being here, hanging out with us. If you enjoy everything that we talk about, please subscribe. Share with a family member. Share with a friend. And then comment down below something you learned about our podcast today. And I remembered what it's called. Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. I've been holding that in this whole time. Oh, that was the movie. Yes, okay. that was the movie. See, I would have never slept until I knew what that was. I, you know, strange thing is when they were filming the first Percy Jackson, mm -hmm. which they filmed in Nashville. What? I lived there and we walked by one time where, where the film set was and there's a park in Nashville called Centennial Park mm -hmm. and there's a replica of the Parthenon there and they use that building for the set that is so yeah. awesome so now that you mentioned that i thought oh i should have known that and i was like it's lightning thief it's lightning thief. <laughs> that's right that was um i can't think of the actor's name now but he used to be a james bond yes yeah yeah okay yes. cool all right pierce Brosnan. there we that's go it. look at us <laughs> <laughs> all right we're boring our people here listen thanks again especially for all of you that are writing me messaging me, giving me topics to talk about. We will do those. We're, they're great ideas. And a special shout out to people that are not in the U.S., uh, yes. Canada, Ireland, South Africa. Um, I, I'm missing many. Germany, Netherlands, um, all of you. We're just appreciative of you. And thank you so much for being a part of our podcast. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Peace. <laughs>